An aircraft is an amazing machine, capable of flying in any direction by rotating about in three dimensions. These are called axes of movement. The average location of an aircraft's mass is a point that is called the centre of gravity. So if you suspend an aircraft from the centre of gravity by a line like this, the aircraft remains perfectly balanced. Each of the three axes moves about the centre of gravity. The aircraft's principal axes are normal axis, drawn from top to bottom, lateral axis, drawn parallel to the wings, and longitudinal axis, drawn from tail to nose. Each axis is perpendicular to the other two axes. Let's look at each individually. The rotation about lateral axis is called pitch. This movement changes the vertical direction of the aircraft's nose. The rotation about normal axis is called yaw. This is the movement of the nose of the aircraft from side to side. The rotation about the longitudinal axis is called roll. This is the movement of the aircraft's wings. One wing goes up, the opposite wing goes down. So in summary, these are the three principal axes of movement. The pilot flies an aircraft, manipulating controls that are linked to devices which are called control services. The wing produces upwards facing lift as it flies through horizontally facing air. So for a set airspeed, how can the wing generate more lift? You can split a section of the wing into a separate surface like this. Hinged and able to move up and down, one such surface is called an aileron. As the aileron moves down, the wing's camber is increased. This results in further reduced static air pressure above the wing and combined with extra deflection of the airflow underneath, the outcome is more lift. Conversely, the lift is reduced when the aileron moves up. Another example is the rudder, which works in similar fashion to an aileron as it moves left or right. With each movement, it essentially produces side-facing lift force due to increased camber and deflected airflow. The ailerons function in opposition. As one moves up, the other moves down. The pilot uses the control column to operate the ailerons by turning it right or left. The primary effect is a roll about the aircraft's centre of gravity. The pilot uses rudder pedals to operate the rudder. Pressing the left pedal moves the rudder left and the primary effect is a yaw to the left. The right rudder yaws the aircraft to the right. The aircraft model in this demonstration is fitted with a stabilator, which is a one-piece design of an elevator. The pilot uses the control column to operate this control surface by pushing it forward or pulling it back. As the stabilator moves up or down, it deflects the relative airflow and causes the aircraft to pitch up or down about its centre of gravity. Finally, there is power. The pilot controls the aircraft's power by the throttle control. For example, more power generated by the propulsion system produces the obvious primary effect of more airspeed. The main control surfaces allow the pilot to rotate the aircraft in three dimensions. 
With each movement, there are further effects of controls. These are the four main forces acting on an aeroplane in flight. The average position of the lift force that is generated by the wings is represented here by the lift arrow. The sum of the aircraft's mass is represented by the weight arrow always pointing down towards the centre of the earth. The forward thrust generated by the power plant and the resistance called drag are shown by opposing horizontal arrows. The primary effect of the ailerons is a roll. As the aeroplane rolls, the lift force rolls with it. Now that the vertical component of the lift is smaller and no longer supports the aeroplane's weight, it causes the aeroplane to slide down. In this example viewed from above, as the aeroplane slides down in the direction of the lower wing, the relative airflow shifts to act from the side. The vertical surface of the rudder is exposed to side-facing airflow, pushing the tail to the left, resulting in a secondary effect that is yaw. The primary effect of rudder is a yaw. As the aeroplane yaws, the outer wing moves forward, further than the inner wing, thus it moves a little faster. Faster airflow equals more lift. Viewed from behind, the result is a roll, which is the secondary effect of using the rudder. The primary effect of the stabilator is pitch. As the aeroplane pitches down, the weight vector now contributes to the forward motion and results in increased airspeed and loss of altitude. The opposite happens to airspeed when the aeroplane is pitched up. So in summary, these are the primary and secondary effects of controls. From the aeroplane illustrated here, one effect of increased power is a stronger spiralling slipstream behind the propeller. This local volume of faster airflow affects the aeroplane's empennage by making the stabilator and the rudder more sensitive to pilot's inputs. In addition to that, the spiralling slipstream has a tendency to wrap around the fuselage. It impacts the rudder on the side and induces a yawing moment to the left for a clockwise rotating propeller. There are several different ways to describe lift. This formula is a mathematical representation of the lift force. Don't switch off just yet, this is not as complicated as it seems. This is known as the lift formula. Firstly, let's define some wing and air characteristics. This is a cross section of the wing. If you slice the wing exactly in half, you will get the mean camber line. The mean camber line is the precise centre of the wing's thickness. So at any point along the mean camber line, the top slice matches the bottom slice. The point where the camber line meets the front end of the wing is called the leading edge. The point where the camber line meets the rear end of the wing is called the trailing edge. When you join the leading edge with the trailing edge by a straight line, you get the chord line. The direction of the air movement relative to the wing is called relative airflow. The angle between the chord line and relative airflow is called the angle of attack. The speed at which the aircraft flies through the air is called airspeed. The projected area of the wing is called the wing surface area. The mass of air molecules within specific volume is called the air density. For example, more molecules equals higher air density. So let's have a look at the lift formula and its elements. Lift is a force. CL stands for the coefficient of lift. This value is determined by engineers as part of the wing design process. It lets us know how much lift the wing can produce at any given angle of attack. 
Thus, the angle of attack is the key component of the coefficient of lift. Rho is the air density. V is the air speed. S is the wing surface area. We can use this formula to work out the aircraft's lift force. We won't do this here. For you, the pilot, this formula presents a clear illustration of the relationship between the angle of attack and airspeed. These two elements of the formula you readily control. What the formula suggests is that for a constant value of lift, if the airspeed increases, the angle of attack must decrease, and vice versa. So in this example, both aircraft are producing the same amount of lift and both are maintaining level flight. The aircraft on top has a higher angle of attack, thus slower airspeed, than the aircraft below, which has a lower angle of attack, but faster airspeed. Drag is the air resistance that opposes flight. It acts parallel and in the same direction as the relative airflow and it's a relentless force that deserves a thorough flight club treatment and your full attention. Total drag consists of drag forces that are linked to lift production, known as induced drag, and those that are not linked to lift production, known as parasite drag. Let's have a look at induced drag. At high angles of attack, the high pressure air below the wing likes to swirl around the wingtip towards the low pressure air above the wing. A twisting vortex of air forms behind the wing, deflecting the airflow downwards. An inclined local airflow is created, which is the average of relative airflow and the deflected airflow, resulting in the lift vector tilting backwards and contributing to total drag. Now for parasite drag, which consists of form drag, skin friction drag, and interference drag. Form drag is caused by disturbed airflow that's separated from the surface and spawned into turbulent wake. The more streamlined an object is, the less form drag it creates. So any obstruction to smooth airflow, such as dangling wheels, will produce form drag. If we flatten a spherical object completely, the only drag we get now is the skin friction. As the name suggests, skin friction depends on the quality of the skin surface the airflow passes over. A laminar flow results when the airflow passes over smooth surfaces, so drag is small. But introduce wing ice or exposed rivets, and a turbulent boundary layer forms, resulting in more skin friction drag. The airflow around the wing may flow faster than the airflow around the fuselage. So where these different airflows meet, interference drag is born because they clash within the space they share. These graphs represent induced and parasite drag against the airspeed. Induced drag is most significant at low airspeeds and high angles of attack, where the pressure differential between the top and bottom of the wing is the greatest. On the other hand, an increase in the airspeed increases parasite drag by a factor of the square of airspeed. So if you double the airspeed, for example, you get four times the parasite drag. Do you know what the point is where the two drag lines meet? Please share your thoughts below. An aircraft is a well-balanced machine. In straight and level flight, all forces are in equilibrium. To understand this concept, let's have a look at the moments of force. This is a balanced seesaw. However, with different weights on each end, it becomes imbalanced. A child's weight is essentially a force of gravity. If one child weighs 10 kilograms, the other weighs 5 kilograms, and they are exactly the same distance away from the centre, how can the seesaw balance again? Since the lighter child is half the weight of the heavier child, you must put her twice as far from the centre to attain the perfect equilibrium. Archimedes once said, Give me a stick long enough and a pivot, and I shall move the world. What all this means is that little force can achieve bigger results given a long enough arm to create the moment of force that is needed. Mathematically, a moment is defined as force multiplied by the arm. Going back to our seesaw analogy, 
we can prove that the lighter child is able to balance the heavier child by using a longer arm to achieve the same moment of force. These arrows represent the four main forces acting on an aeroplane in flight. For demonstration purposes, these forces are often shown to act from a single spot, but in reality that's not the case. On a typical light aircraft, the average of weight is slightly forward of lift. Thrust is above drag. Combining the moments of these forces together suggests that in this configuration the aeroplane has a natural tendency to pitch down. So how is this fixed? The stabilator takes care of it by generating an opposing downward force. This downward force does not need to be great since the arm is long which helps to create a moment of force that is strong enough for the aeroplane to remain in equilibrium. Forward centre of gravity causes the aircraft to develop a pitching down tendency. Equilibrium is regained with help from the elevator, which creates a counterbalancing downward facing force. Unfortunately, this downward facing force increases the aircraft's apparent weight, which means that more lift needs to be generated to keep the forces balanced. According to the lift formula, once the critical angle of attack has been reached, more apparent weight requires more lift, causing the only other variable, stall speed, to increase as well. Remember the two Fs. Forward centre of gravity equals faster stall speed.